okay what's up guys it's shelby we're back for another video thank you for tuning in today we're going to be talking about doing vent checks um if you're a student and you know you're maybe like in the middle of your program your critical care semester may be coming up you may have had thoughts about this semester maybe you have a little bit of fear and anxiety uh, about what's to come this is a semester that you migrate from patients that are breathing on their own talking alert awake to patients that are sedated not talking can't really breathe on their own you can't speak to them um, and they're really a lot sicker than what you've been used to um, so we're going to talk about doing a vent check how to do a vent check um, the things you should be paying attention to just some tips and tricks. I know that every therapist is different. Um, so this is my method. This is the way that I do vent checks. Um, and you know, that's that. If you have any tips, tricks, suggestions, um, you can leave all that down below in the comments. But once again, it's just a little disclaimer. Some people might agree, disagree. I don't know. Maybe the order is out of order, but don't kill me. Okay. That's how I do a vent check. So, um, we'll just start from the beginning so you might have a wow which is the computer that you're rolling around and um when you first get to the patient's room when you first get inside i honestly would look at the patient um, i would look at the patient first and uh, make a very quick assessment on can you proceed <laughs> meaning you want to look at the patient you want to see if their breathing is labored if they look comfortable if they look like they're sedated enough um you know you want to make sure the ventilator is you know connected and things of that nature you want to just make a quick look a quick glance make sure that your patient i mean is looking all right also in that quick glance you want to look at the vitals really quick you want to look at the vitals to make sure that the heart rate isn't extra high which is called tachycardia and you want to make sure that your oxygen looks good as well so part of your very quick assessment um there should be some meds hanging on an IV pole, I honestly um, take a look at those meds um, because very quickly, once you get the hang of things and once you uh, are able to identify medications and what they're used for, based on how much of a certain medication or different medications that the patient is on, you can very quickly make an assessment of how bad or how sick this patient is right um, you'll be able to tell if they're on multiple pressors one two three or four that's a very big indication of how severe the patient is um, their sedation how many sedatives is it taking to keep the patient comfortable and how much of each are they using um, is the patient on any antibiotics um, there's different things that you're gonna come to learn as you become more familiar with the medication. So I would make a note of the medications that the patient is on um, very quickly, maybe write it down. And then I would go over to my ventilator. Um, so you know your patient's stable pretty much. You know your patient's stable and um, you have to do your vent check. Um, when you log into your charting system, um, the way that different hospitals chart might be differently and what they chart might be different, but you have to chart your event checks. You have to document that you've seen the patient. Um, you have to document what the numbers are at the time that you're seeing patient. Um, so that's the part that I usually move on to. Um, when it comes to the ventilator, you want to verify the patient settings that are actually on the machine with the doctor's order. Sometimes doctors can come around and switch things without a respiratory therapist knowledge or sometimes along the mix maybe some settings have been changed you never know maybe you know the therapist changed some settings and didn't update an order but you want to confirm your order with what is on the ventilator screen if you see any difference in that I would honestly the next shift has already went home so I would um, you know, go to the primary nurse and confirm and ask is she or ha or he have they been aware of any changes made to the ventilator? 
Um, if not, then it would be time to call the doctor most likely because it's very important um, when it comes to blood gases um, and regulating the patient's pH and you know their ventilatory status, you wanna make sure that um, the rate in the tidal volume and things like that and the FiO2, the PEEP, you wanna make sure that that is what is ordered. And also another way to verify the vent settings um, would be to check the previous respiratory therapist charting. I would do that. Um, so once you do that, you want to go on and look at the patient's measurements, meaning what the patient is actually doing. Um, this will consist of, you know, their respiratory rate and are they breathing over the ventilator? So do they have any spontaneous respiratory efforts? You can see that. You wanna check the peak pressure. The peak pressure should really be no more than 30. Um, sometimes patients can sit a little bit higher than that, but you really wanna look at the peak pressure, the mean, their respiratory rate, their tidal volume. The tidal volume is important. You wanna make sure that the patient is returning the volumes that you're delivering. So if, you, you're, if the ventilator is set on a 500 tidal volume, the patient should be returning. Uh, that's the, the VTE, tidal volume exhaled. Um, you want to make sure that that is reading somewhere very close to what is being delivered. If not, if it's lower, um, significant lower, significantly lower, I'd say maybe even about 50 cc's, um, you probably would want to add um, some air in the cuff of the ET tube because there's probably a leak somewhere. Um, the minute ventilation, you're going to be charting the alarms on the, your ventilator. You're going to be double checking, making sure that everything is appropriate. Some respiratory therapists like their alarms a bit more spread out than others do because maybe there's been an issue with the patient coughing spontaneously a lot and maybe this peak pressure has just been going off. They're raising the peak pressure. I don't know. Um, maybe they're just comfortable with a bit more wider settings, but you're the therapist, you're on shift now, what do you feel comfortable with? Go ahead and change your alarm settings to what you feel comfortable with. Um, that's what I would do. Um, and after I check the ventilator, um, you know, make sure that the brakes are on the ventilator at the bottom. Um, believe it or not, you just make sure that the brakes are on the ventilator because you don't want the ventilator rolling away from the patient, which is gonna tug the circuit and tug the ET tube. There can be a disconnect there. Um, I don't know, there might just be some random movement, maybe an earthquake, I don't know, but make sure that the brakes are on the ventilator is really important. Um, then the next thing, um, I definitely assess my patient. I do a full assessment on my patient, um, but I just kind of work in different ways and different stages. We already made sure that the patient was physically, numerically stable um, on all ends, so we're gonna go ahead and move to the actual physical assessment of the patient. Um, one of the very first things that I do is make sure that uh, their ET tube is in the right place. Um, again, you want to verify the patient's order, the doctor's order. You want to verify from previous RTs charting, but mostly you're going to go off the doctor's order. If it says um, um, it's a 8.0 at 25 at the lip, that's what you're looking for. You're going to go to the tube. There is a number on the tube, which is going to tell you what size. And then there are also like little hash marks on the ET tube that tell you what centimeter that uh, the tube is at. So again, if it's an 8.0 at 25, you want to make sure that it's an 8.0 tube, 25 at the lip. Um, and if you're good, you can go ahead and move on. If it's not, let's say maybe it's at a 23 at the lip. That means that the tube has slid out two centimeters, which might not be that big of a deal, but what you're gonna go ahead and do to confirm that placement is once again, look at the ventilator. Is the patient returning the volumes? If the patient is returning the volumes, then okay, the tube may have slipped out, may be a good placement. Also, we're gonna listen to the lung sounds. We gotta do that anyway, but listen to the lung sounds. If you have lung sounds on each lobe, then okay, the tube being out of place may not be that big of a deal. Also, before we leave the room or head on to the next patient, we're gonna check the x-ray. The x-ray, um, they should be doing x-rays about every morning on ventilated patients, and you wanna confirm the tube placement uh, via the last known x-ray as well. Um, if it's in good placement and 
you know, it's, it was charted at 25, then you know that 25 is, and that's the doctor's order, then I would honestly push the two back into 25 because that's what was last visually known as a good placement for the tube. Um, and that's again, the doctor's orders, because when you intubate and do all of those, all of those things, you get an x-ray after intubation. So you know that the tube is in a good placement. So you really, really want to make sure that the tube is in a good placement. If you are listening to the lungs and you hear lung sounds on the right and really none on the left, and you notice there's an unequal chest rise and fall, that could mean that the tube has slid in too far. It may, may be a right main stem intubation. I'd go ahead and make a note of that. Um, recommend an x-ray just to make sure that the tube is in good placement again and proceed. Um, our job solely is the airway. So we got to make sure everything is good with the airway and I'm about to run out of space. So I'll be right back. Okay, back to what I was saying. Um, but our primary job is as a respiratory therapist is the airway. So that is really most of what we're gonna be paying attention to and focusing on on our assessments um, and anything related to that. So when it comes to the ET tube, we already checked the placement. I would say that that's the most important thing. The second most important thing I would say is to check the air in the cuff. Um, I would check the air in the cuff. Um, if you're at a hospital that's pretty modern, then you have a cuff manometer that actually shows a number. And you, I would kind of fill it up to an appropriate number. Also, you want to look at the ventilator and see at that appropriate number, which I think in school is like 25 to 30, if the patient is returning volumes. Again, if they're not returning volumes, there's a leak in that a cuff, a cuff. A cuff not being inflated enough is definitely one of the reasons why there can be a leak. So you want to go ahead, make sure, check the cuff, and you're going to learn how to do that in school, but check the cuff. Um, suction before you deflate the cuff, if anything, because you don't want anything that's on top of that cuff. Nasty drool, maybe vomit, I don't know, um, but you don't want anything to fall and slide down into the lung. So, But your teacher, your preceptors, they'll go ahead and school you on how to do that. Also, um, if you're at a hospital where they do oral care, oral care is when you um, clean and you're responsible. It's like a shared duty between respiratory therapists and nurses. You are responsible for cleaning inside of the patient's mouth. Um, we want to keep that environment as healthy as possible. So I would do that. Um, another big, 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 big thing would be, I would say, skin breakdown. We're going to be checking for skin breakdown. So the thing that holds the ET tube on is called an anchor fast or whatever device you may use. Um, but there's it's it sits pretty tight. You have to strap it on pretty tight to the patient's face. Um, and there's points of high pressure there. Once patients have been intubated for a couple of days or maybe a week, your skin can start to break down from you know, they're just being too much pressure. I think it like just decreases the blood flow. It's just, it's just wounds happen. They come, um, it's our responsibility because it's a respiratory device that's causing the damage, if any. So you want to go ahead and peel back some of that sticky stuff. Make sure that the skin is in good condition. If it's not, if you notice a little bit of redness, if you notice some scabbing, if you're peeling off skin with the thing, it's not uncommon. Um, go ahead, make a note of it. Notify your nurse so they can get a wound care team, wound care consult or whatever. But you do want to document that. You'll be surprised how many patients, families, you know, you don't want to be sued for anything or whatever because the patient sustained some injuries while under our care. So I'd go ahead and make a note of that. Um, let's see. Honestly, when it comes to, so one thing I would check um, is going to be if the patient is on an HME, which is a heated heat moisture exchanger. Um, you want to make sure that that's not saturated. Um, you want to make sure every, you want to start your shift off good. Change any filters on the ventilator, um, the HME if you need to. Uh, make sure that you're stocked. You want saline. Um, you want um, oral care and honestly, a bag valve mask. You want an AMBU bag somewhere by because it's the ICU. These patients are unpredictable. You have no idea what might happen. I also would suggest plugging that AMBU bag into the oxygen flow meter. It takes two seconds and honestly, trust me, you'll appreciate yourself way more if there's a code that happens and you already have the bag plugged up into the oxygen. All you have to do is turn the flow meter on, disconnect the ventilator and bag. Sometimes things can get a bit hectic and then you're 
running around looking for stuff and thank me later go ahead and just take that extra step to make sure that you know you're one step ahead of the game um i'd make sure that i had all of my things ready for the rest of my shift and other than that i mean that's really it um I think that's it. <laughs> and I would leave the room and go to the next patient's room. Um, honestly, that is a perfect scenario if everything is going right. If you get on shift and your ventilator is alarming and that happens to be what brings you to the room in the first place, the first thing I would do is go to the ventilator, look at what's alarming and address the concern. I wouldn't, I would look at the patient, um, look at the vitals and everything, look at the ventilator, go address the alarm, go address what's ringing. But I wouldn't look at the meds. I wouldn't, you know, this, 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 and do the whole process. Go to the ventilator. It could be something very serious. It could be a patient disconnect. Um, I would go ahead and go to the ventilator and address the concern. And then once you fix it, go ahead and carry on with the rest of my assessment. That's just my suggestion. Um, other than that, I feel like that's pretty much what I do on a vent check. Um, let me think of anything else really quick. Um, suctioning. I did not say suctioning. A part of your assessment should be suctioning. Um, it's our first time taking care of this patient. It's our job to know what is going on with the patient even if the patient isn't coughing even if the last shift reported that oh no secretions oh barely any secretions who cares therapists lie therapists have their own perception of things it's your job to patient i mean to suction so you'll go ahead and learn how to suction while you're in school but i would go ahead and suction pull back and make a note of anything that you find what color are the secretions is it really thick if it's really really thick that's what you need the saline for you want to go ahead and lavage down the tube but you do need to suction it's a perfect big part of your exam and that's that other than that i feel like that completes a vent check on my behalf and that's going to conclude this video it's pretty long but I mean, it's really necessary. If you guys have any other questions, feel free to ask. I'm here if you need me, but that was your video on how to do a vent check. I'll talk to you guys later.